Hello, I'm Dylan. And I'm Keon. And this is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we try and assassinate the Queen with Aspen. Because this week we watched, uh, I mean, listened to The Marian Conspiracy. By Jacqueline Rayner. Directed by Gary Russell. And released on March 12th, 2000. You know, that Freudian slip right there where I said watched instead of listened to uh, is because, you know, and I'm just going to drop this right at the beginning. I don't know if this is true for you, Keon, but I got heavy massacre vibes from this story. <laughs> yeah, now that you say that, yes, kind of. I mean, it's, you know, the whole Catholic, Protestant, like religious conflict, mm-hmm. the, yep. the pure historical aspect of the whole thing, the like Evelyn being like one of the major plot drivers of the story, the companion being the main plot driver of the story. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of. Uh uncanny similarities i guess you could say now thankfully this wasn't massacre levels of boring but it was um what 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 you words i used to describe before we started recording i think i said inconsequential inconsequential yeah you know i agree I, i guess we're just starting right off the bat with this i agree that it wasn't massacre level i i think the words i used to describe this before we started recording uh was that i i have literally no strong feelings about this story at all you know the previous ones that we've listened to either i liked i really liked or maybe i disliked or i didn't like that much but this one i have like i i don't really have strong enough feelings to be like yeah the story was good or the story was bad i i do think there was some interesting thematic um there's some interesting thematic things going yes. on in this story mm-hmm. Uh, that I think those I found quite interesting, but I think overall, like you said, the plot feels a little inconsequential. And to me, maybe that's because the entire plot is quite circular. You know, the reason why Evelyn gets drawn into this is because Evelyn is the one who is causing her to disappear from reality. It's just like, it's like entirely self-contained and, and, uh, Circular. Yeah, I didn't mind that. That might actually have something to do with, like, um, you know, what this story is kind of saying about religion, which we can obviously get into later. But, like, for me, I just, I obviously, well, not obviously, but I did, as I usually do, just listen to this. But as I finished, as I was finishing it, I was thinking, like, man, the most entertaining parts of this were, like, not even related to the, the core problem at hand. Like, I, I enjoyed the scenes where it was just, like, them trying hot chocolate for the first time, like, more than anything else, really. Or, like, the scenes of the Doctor and Evil and just kind of sort of bickering or, or just kind of, you know, uh, bantering or whatever. That, that was kind of what I enjoyed the most from this, which is, you know, it just that says a lot about the story itself, I think. I know you enjoyed the parts of the story where Evelyn was just introducing Tudor English people to uh, technology from the future. Right. Te- technology. This has to be the first time anyone in history has referred to hot chocolate as technology. Well, hey, it's true. It is true that it is because it's like it's a she's she's using the powdered form of hot chocolate, right? So it's like a powdered drink. That's that's tech. I guess. <laughs> Hot chocolate technology. Well, as we- yeah, welcome to Trust Your Doctor, <laughs> the experts in hot chocolate technology. I haven't had hot chocolate in, in years. Really? Years? It's a long time. Yeah, here. I can't even remember it. Maybe even more than 10 years. I don't even know. Probably more than 10 years, actually. I don't even... That's not true. I do remember what it tastes like, but but just barely. Well, you could go have hot chocolate right now and remind yourself. I don't have any. I couldn't get it. Well, I could get it very quickly, but not not immediately, you know. Also, that would necessitate leaving my room slash house, neither of which I tend to do. Mm, well, okay. Well, I you know, it was worth a shot, I suppose. Another, another thing that's worth a shot is inserting our discussion of the time scales uh, here before we really get into the story, which seems like a a bit of a trend. Seems like that's what we've been doing. So why not replicate that here? Why not do it again? Uh, 
Yeah, well, the time scales are wrong this week. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know why I came out swinging like that. Well, Doctor Who uh, audio fans, at least the ones who use this site, um, do say that this story is perhaps better than uh, you and I thought it was. They rated it pretty highly. Yeah, higher than the Fear Manga, which is still my favorite of the ones we've listened to so far, I think. I think I, I think in Just, hindsight, you know, with some space, I think I like the Fear Manga better than Whispers of Terror, so Yeah, well I still like uh I don't even remember the name of it. <laughs> the the one with the hybrids in the in Alaska and all that. Uh, whatever it was called, I can't remember. As usual, I can't remember Doctor Who story names yet. So just someone brings up like a random episode of Blake Seven. I'm like, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Didn't you love Gold? I, I just know the name. Yeah, I know. Well, Gold is one of the more memorable ones. Actually. Well, yeah, because it's the heist episode. <laughs> like, yeah, or like Mission to Destiny or something like that. Or like Power. Remember Power? No, honestly, I don't. <laughs> it was the colonialism one. <laughs> Remember where they were like that king was sort of torn between like Oh between, oh You don't remember that one? I do now. <laughs> Based on your description of it, but yeah, by name, no. Yeah. I I'm pretty sure that was that one, but I might be wrong about that. If I am wrong, I'll put it in the show notes. Anyway, just to break down what the time scales is saying here, they have plotted an eight point six, acting at a nine point one, effects at an eight point three and replay at an 8.5. I do agree with that final one. This one, considering the few interesting twists that did come along, I'd say it is uh, worth listening to again. Uh, if you really have nothing better to do with your life. <clears throat> Implying that listening to Big Finish means you have nothing better to do with your life? Maybe. Maybe. Well, maybe re-listening to them means that. Hmm. You know, there's so many big finished audios that, like, if, if we're just going to uh, um, assume as, like, a baseline thing here that listening for the first time is always and unequivocally better than re-listening, like, if you're re-listening to them, then it's just like, what do you, you've listened to so much, you know, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, if you've gone through all of them and you have to now re-listen... You've listened to hundreds upon hundreds already. I know. Well, I was going to say something, too, about, uh, you know, you're like, oh, if you re-listen, you have nothing better to do. And I'm like, ah, yes, says the man who re-listened to Phantasmagoria. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. I'm not exempting myself from this. Okay. If anything, I'm including myself. Hmm. A classic trust your doctor tradition just roasting ourselves on the podcast I know yeah Interesting, interestingly the time scales already has Shudi Gatwa um, they, they did since his uh, since the announcement but I, we didn't bring it up in, until now I guess um, they have him on there so they act fast they act fast Yeah, they had. I noticed him on there uh, last week when we were mm-hmm. looking at pff, the fear manga. I was like, "What? Why can't I remember?" Also, uh, completely only semi-related uh, at all. Like, why? Uh, I don't know why this is, but like, nineteen people liked our fear manga post on Facebook for some reason. Like, it got way more interaction than we normally get on Facebook. Mm, probably got shared by someone who has a large audience or um, or at least has a large audience of Big Finish uh, listeners or something like that. I'll just try and post at the same time. I posted that at like a uh, at a different time than I normally do. I think it was more like four in the afternoon. So I'll try and replicate that. Yeah, why not? I am, I am now intending um, to be more active on the social media as well. Uh, you now heard that it here first. Falk's Keon's going to be more for, active on social media. For a while. For a while. Then I'll probably Forever. disappear again. No, no, no. Forever. <laughs> no, just just for a while. I'll probably disappear again uh, soon enough, but for a while. Now that I've finished a couple things that I've been working on for longer than I wanted to work on them, uh, none of which shall be named or expounded upon here. 
cryptic. I, like I know, that. yeah, that was the point. <laughs> to make the to make these things sound more mysterious than they really are. If I actually said what they were, they would just be lame and fall flat. Kind of like this story. Right. And though well that's that's the thing too, is like the story wasn't bad, but like um to, to bring us into it, I guess. The beginning foreshadows like an epic time travel um an actual for actually for once time travel based story and then when we actually get into it it's just sort it's like of like a pure historical right it's just sort of political meandering in the 1500s there well, is you know, a little the, bit the, the, be- <laughs> the best thing about doctor who is that it's got every genre you could have ever wanted in a TV show, political meandering in the present day, <laughs> political meandering in the 1500s, political meandering on Dalek planets, political meandering on other generic humanoid planets, political meandering in the future, political meandering in BC times. You know, it's everything you could ever want from a TV <laughs> show. <laughs> right. Th- this uh, this entire, like, um, conception of this story, remember, like, um, uh, God, what, I forget what the story was called. Um, it was with, I believe it was with the the ninth Doctor and Rose, where it's like they la- uh, they land on New Earth, and they're they they're like, look at that, look at New New York and all its majesty, and they just pan over to a hospital, and that's where the rest of the story takes place. I know it's like, look at that cool stuff over there. Okay, <laughs> now let's go to the main plot. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, because it begins with, like, Evelyn Smythe giving a lecture, and uh, the doctor's got a beeping device in the background, and Evelyn's like, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, j- don't worry about me. And then she finishes, she, like, dismisses everyone because she can't, like, give the lecture, which, you know, this is an accurate representation of college lectures. Uh, and he, like, walks up, and he's like, that's weird. Like, you're the nexus point. And she's like, what does that even mean? And he's like, you're the nexus point in... Uh, you're like being erased from time or something like that and she's like what and he's like yes she's now obviously come with me let's figure this out she's skeptical of the entire situation i believe she just leaves and then he, he the, she does the, actually the doctor, just leave the doctor just follows her back to her house or her place or whatever she yeah, she just leaves and he's like what the heck so he goes to her house and she's like kate why are you here and he's like look we got to figure out like why you're the nexus point. And she's like, well, leave me. And, and he's like, have you been feeling weird lately? Disappearing headaches. And she's like, yes, actually. And he's like, it's because you're being erased from history. And she's like, what? I don't believe you. The, the reason why she actually engages with him more um, in the first place though, is because he, he says that her lecture is like wrong. Like he, he kind of calls her out on it and this gets her, Sort of, uh, it sort of ruffles her feathers a little bit. Yeah, it rustles her jimmies. She also, um, interestingly enough, she hints at like some that she gives preferential treatment to certain students, right? Didn't she say she like she baked a chocolate cake for a particular student, and she's yes. she's knitting a sweater for a student? Which yes. is like, if I, this story is only twenty years old, but I feel like if that happened today and or where we're from, like that would be getting investigated in some way. <laughs> she's doing the, uh, to make a Harry Potter reference, which I can't believe I'm about to do. She's doing, she's pulling a Horace Slughorn. <laughs> Who is that? All the Harry Potter fans in the audience just went, ah, yes. And all of the non-Harry Potter fans just did exactly what, what Keon did and went, who the, is that? Horace Slughorn sounds like a name you would make up if you didn't know anything about Harry Potter and you're just like, oh yeah, Harry Potter character Horace Slughorn, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> Yeah, except the worst part about that is that he is actual, <laughs> actually a real character. I didn't make him up. JK, shout out JK. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Just geez. kidding, Roland. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> um. Well, so the doctor says that the only way that they can resolve this uh, uh, space-time conundrum is by space-timing themselves back to the 1500s and seeing whether or not uh, Evelyn's ancestor really did live 
because according to the doctor, he didn't. No, no, but well, Evelyn says that he does, and the doctor says, yeah, prove it, and Evelyn pulls out a family tree she's built, and she's like, all the names are erased, and he's like, "Uh uh-oh. Right, sort of, you know, Back to the Future-esque, right, he's sort of disappearing from the photograph type thing. So I think they go back to the, like, the earliest name that's still apparent on the family tree, because they figure that they're probably the one who's being tampered with since everybody after them is being erased. Right. It was at this particular moment that I realized I loved the soundtrack in this. I don't know if you paid any attention to it, but like... I paid mild attention to it. It was mm-hmm. alright. I mean, I enjoyed it, I guess. It was Alistair Locke, I believe. E- Let's check if Firefox would stop being dumb as it usually is. Yes, it was. Yeah, it had that vibe of like You know, I guess this is just an anecdotal thing for me as to why I liked it. But, like, you know, when I'm I'm in the car, like, I'll typically turn on the radio and I'll want to listen to classical music or or at least something with no vocals. Um, But, like, most of the time when you turn it to the classical music station, I guess I could just play it off my phone, but whatever, I'm old school. So, like, you turn the radio to the classical music station and the one around here usually plays, like, uh, j- just songs that have that sort of guitar or like banjo esque thing, like playing in the background, <laughs> and that kind of just ruins it for me. And this this soundtrack sort of had that vibe without that sort of backing, like that backing twang. So I liked it for that. Appreciate it for that, rather. Appreciated. I appreciate that you corrected your grammar twice in that sentence. Good job. <laughs> Proud of you. Well, okay, so they go back in time. What's the first thing that happens when they go back in time? Um, well, let's check my they, notes. Yeah, I know. They, they Scooby-Doo the hell out of this. The first thing um, they do is split up. This is, I guess, so Evelyn, we should mention, becomes a an audio-specific companion. She is an audio-specific yeah. companion. So this is her yes. introduction story, we should... She was created for Big Finish, by Big Finish. <laughs> for fans, and this by is her fans. this story. Um, yeah. She has no reaction to the TARDIS being bigger on the inside, and also is the first companion we've ever seen, like... She tells the doctor, like, oh, I'm coming with you. And he's like, no, you're not. And she's like, yes, I am. And you can't stop me. And she (laughs) starts packing, like, a toiletry bag. And the doctor's like, what are you doing? And she's like, I want to make sure that I've got everything I need. Mm -hmm. So she's sort of of hard-headed and and, uh, headstrong uh, at the same time. And uh, as she soon realizes, in over her head... (laughs) As I mentioned before, I did like the dynamic between her and the sixth doctor. The sixth, this is the story is also sh- like giving the sixth doctor some like the time of day, especially with a companion such as Evelyn. You know, I think perhaps this the dynamic that we get in this story. Um, you know, it made me look back on the Sixth Doctor's actual time in the show and be like, yeah, actually, he should have had a companion uh, with a personality more like Evelyn's. Yeah, it's because I think it works so well on the story because the Sixth Doctor is very brash and he always tries to command the room when he walks into more so than most of the other Doctors. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, we when we see him in, you know... I, for the three seconds we see him of time of the Rani, I guess. But I think the idea is that by the time he gets there, he's mellowed out a lot. And I think part of that is, you know, Evelyn as a companion, which I think is a good idea on Big Finish's part to give him someone who basically uh, is as has, is as headstrong as he is and sometimes basically knocks him down a peg. Because Perry and Mel both were like, you know... They- I, I like both Perry and Mel in, in concept, but they both just really were like the sixth doctor is like punching packs. Yeah, they were pretty much the exact opposite of Evelyn. Well, anyway, Evelyn is pretty excited to go hit up the local pub. Yeah. 
Well, so the doctor gives her a little um, machine uh, that she puts in her bag. Um, and it's it's just a machine to basically keep her around. <laughs> right. It, it staves off the effects of the... Uh, the the disappearing thing. Right. So she goes to the pub while the doctor goes to investigate uh, the palace. Because we forgot to mention, I think we forgot to mention, that Evelyn's ancestors were connected. They weren't royals, but they were connected and had always had always been connected to the nobility. Mm-hmm. Now, at this point in the story, they both believe that they are in the Elizabethan era. Right. That turns out not to be the case, as we soon learn. They're in, what, the Marian era? The Marian era, yeah. Yeah. So this is this is actually like the twist at the end of part one. It's actually like it's pre- it's a pretty good twist to be honest. Yep. Because I mean the eras are very similar visually and culturally, except for the fact that Queen Mary was heavily anti-Protestant and Elizabeth the first was not. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a good twist, doubly so, because uh, as we already know, time is being wonky and is being changed. So you think like, oh, did they actually go back to the the correct time and things are being like history is being thrown out of whack or did they just get it wrong? You don't fully know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I guess if you're like um, competently knowledgeable, let's say, in British history, uh, you would know that this is fine. Right. But for outsiders like us, I suppose it's. It's kind of like, like you said, is it, uh, it, did something go wrong or are they just in the wrong time period? Mm -hmm. The other uh, cliffhanger, I think, of part one, I believe this was in part one, uh, Evelyn says something like untoward about uh, about religion. she She says, long live Queen Elizabeth and everyone goes, what? Right, that's how you find out they... Everyone else in the pub is like, they take great offense to this. And basically take up arms against her. <laughs> Into part two, she, uh, she, I guess, flees with two undercover Protestants. Yeah, well, so the, the bartenders, like, take her outside to deal with her. And everyone's like, oh, okay. Um... Okay, <laughs> and the two people who take her outside are, I guess, Le- secret Protestants. Yes, they're like they're Leaf said. and Crow, and they've kind of been enlisted by, by um, who he was a bishop, I guess, or a, a reverend, by by Reverend Thomas Smith. Yeah, they've been sort of enlisted into his plot to, uh, overthrow the government, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, the doctor has been talking to. Uh, both Sarah, who is, uh, I guess, Mary's aide, or... She's her lady. Oh, her maid. lady in <laughs> right. And to the queen herself. Yeah. The doctor has, at this point, learned that Queen Mary's on the throne and has actually figured out that this is correct, that they landed three years too early. Mm-hmm. Mary also believes that she's pregnant but actually isn't. I believe this is a historical thing. Like, this actually happened, right? Like, she thought she was pregnant or something, but she actually wasn't. Yeah, Evelyn mentions this. This actually becomes a plot point later that Evelyn has accidentally mentioned to Thomas Smith that she's not pregnant. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how that works. How can you How can you think that you are, but you're not? You know, like, you would you would know after a couple months, like... You know what I mean? Like, you would know. Oh, yeah, you would know (laughs) after a couple months, but this is like the beginning, you know? This is not, uh, this is not a couple of months. (laughs) This is, uh... Yeah. Although they said that she would go on to do this multiple times. Yeah. Sucks to suck, I guess. Like that she would have, like, phantom pregnancies multiple times. Which, okay, you know... She also, we learn, um, 
learn in quotes because this, is, this itself is a rather uh, known thing, even if you're not familiar with this period of, of, of history or these people, that Mary is like super, super anti-Protestant. Um, yeah, she's trying to basically reverse the reformation of the English church. I was reading a little bit about right. this before we started because I was, I don't know, I guess the story prompted me to look it up. Yeah, and you were waiting half an hour for me to finish yeah, it. Well, that too. That too. <laughs> um, I, you know, I wasn't going to throw you under the bus, but since you threw yourself under the bus, I guess I'll just back up and do it again. It's, it's fine. I have like extremely little fame, so can't really say anything that'll offend me too uh, much. If, and if you do, I'll just say it myself, or if you don't, rather. Amy, go ahead. So, yeah, she was, like, really against the, the reformation of the English church. And uh, so she basically announced past this law that Protestants would be burned uh, at the stake, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I believe – I could be wrong about this, but I believe that her husband was from Spain, which is why they have the ambassador from Spain, like, kind of in the picture. Um, and this connection to Spain – I think was was uh, I, I, I could be wrong about this. If I am, I'll put it in the show notes. But I believe this. It's like it was this connection to Spain that like that like really fueled the intense Catholicism. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yes. Yeah, so she's married to the king of Spain, or well, not the king. She's married to Philip the Second of Spain, who was the king of Spain. Mm. Uh, in 1556 onward, but so Mary married Philip before he became king of Spain, mm -hmm. and then he ascended to the throne. But the the guy in this story is the French ambassador, right? Um, and the reason why Spain is like around is because the French ambassador is trying to prevent the English from getting involved in the war on the Spanish side. I don't know exactly what war. Mm. This is a little outside my realm of expertise now. Not that we not that we weren't outside my realm of expertise when we started talking English kings and queens, right? Yeah, you're right about that. He he is the French ambassador. We get like an amazing ac French accent from him, <laughs> from Barnaby Edwards, uh, <laughs> no less. The acting in this story was pretty good, ex except for the fact, and this is not the acting fault so much as just. I don't know, my fault, I guess, but like George Crow and William Leaf sounded exactly the same to me. I don't know if you had that problem, but I couldn't tell them apart at all by their voice. Like, I could only tell them apart when Evelyn would be like, oh, uh, William, or something like that. The, they, maybe. I didn't particularly notice that, but like, they're also not super duper consequential. Yeah. They kind of are, but like, not. They're, they're like. They're, yeah, they're not. They're really not. <laughs> yeah, in part two, uh, Evelyn introduces them to hot chocolate and and accidentally mentions that aspirin can be lethal if you have too much of it. Yeah, so what happens is she, they, she gets taken to, like, I guess their base of operations, which I think was just some sort of shack out in the woods. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Like we mentioned before, they're working with Reverend Thomas Smith, um, and they are plotting to kill Mary. Yeah, so they they take Evelyn because she offhandedly, accidentally mentions that uh, she'll help them put Elizabeth on the throne. Partially because yeah. I, I think because she hasn't actually figured out what year they're in. I think she's still thinking they're in Elizabethan eras. And, like, what's gone wrong is that Mary's on the throne when she shouldn't be. I, I don't think right. she's actually figured out what year she's in, like the Doctor has. Mm hmm And so there's this funny, like, exchange between them where she's, like, they, they're, like, they're decrying the, the basically, Inquisition-like burnings at the stake um, <laughs> of Protestants. And then um, Evelyn says, like, oh, yes, you know... Um, uh, it is horrible, isn't it? And they're just like, yeah. If only if it was the if only it was the Catholics burning at the stake <laughs> instead. <laughs> and she goes, wait, what? <laughs> right. 
So she's she's like her mindset is totally, totally removed from where they're at. <laughs> yeah. Like we mentioned before, she um, I believe this is in part two. She gives them like some modern stuff. I I I, uh, I didn't assume this, but I like imagined like. You know, it feels like if you just gave someone from the 1500s, 1500s, like, modern processed food, they would just, like, either get extremely sick or maybe just, like, keel over and die or something. Like, you know, imagine sort of ingesting that type of thing when your body is not used to it whatsoever. Yeah, she's like, oh, get me some water. And they're like, what? And he's like... She, excuse me, is like, yeah, we're going to drink it. And they're like, what? No one drinks the water around here. We we just, we don't do that. And she's like, well, if you boil it, it'll be fine. And they're like, what? Now, what is this heresy? I know that that too stood out to me um, as something I really focused on. I think in the story is like, it's something you don't think about, right? Is that like people from, these aren't even ancient times. They're just like, I don't know, Renaissance times or something. But like, even back then, People, they, people didn't even drink water. It was like, you couldn't drink it. Yeah, they, she also asks for milk, and they're like, you want what? Yeah, well, they. I think they do, they, they do, like, drink milk, but they're just like, there's no cows around, so, like, how are we going to drink milk? Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway... She, uh, revealing the, her aspirin is actually one of Evelyn's many mistakes in this story. Another one comes shortly thereafter. I think she reveals that Mary isn't actually pregnant to Thomas. Now this was sort of... because Thomas is like, oh yeah, Mary's pregnant and like, she's trying to basically... The, the reason why they want to depose Mary now before she gives birth is because if she gives birth, she'll have an heir. Right. So that even if they do kill her, it'll just her heir will take over. Yeah. This was kind of like a. It, it was almost like looking back in the moment, it felt important, but looking back, it was kind of just. It was another sort, of almost inconsequential thing of like, oh, they introduced this thing of like they they're not going to kill, um, her if they think if they think she's pregnant because they don't want to kill like a baby. Mm-hmm. But, like, what if they just wipe that clean from the story, you know? <laughs> uh, not much plot beat to plot beat wise changes. Until the end. Uh, yeah. Now, the doctor has been talking also to Sarah, and he's been sort of teasing out her grievances. We get the idea from her, her conversation and her tone of voice that... These are some pent-up thoughts, right? You can't really openly voice your opposition to uh, to your ruler, basically, at this time, especially when you're as close to her as Sarah is. And so when the doctor sort of teases this out, we get the impression that this has been a long time coming, or she's been harboring mm-hmm. these thoughts for a long time. Which is that uh, while she is, you know, Mary's... Uh, what was the phrase you used? Not what la- lady in waiting. Right. While she's Mary's lady in waiting, she doesn't agree with some of the policies she's put in place. Yeah. Such Maybe as the one about burning Protestants at the stake. <laughs> well, and also the one about uh, about voiding all marriages between uh, clergy, and yeah, but just uh, within the clergy, because. I, I guess as I re- I didn't recall this, but the story reminded me like Protestants are okay with clergy members marrying, but Catholics are not. I think. Yeah. And so this should be like this also, like the fearmonger. This one kind of had like a mystery element to it, where it's like you can put the pieces together at this point in the story, but I personally didn't, of course. It's like Sarah's upset that their voice that uh, clergy related marriages are being voided. There's Thomas Smith, who is a member of the clergy. There is, you know, I don't know if we know Sarah's last name uh, at this point, but it's Whiteside, <laughs> which was part of the last name of Evil Investor. It was Smith Whiteside. 
all I'm saying is you can put the mm-hmm. <laughs> all I'm saying is you can put the pieces together. I was actually we should mention Evelyn's last name is actually Smythe, and she remarks at the beginning yeah. of the story that it was because whoever who one of her ancestors considered Smith too common, so they changed it to Smythe. The doctor's over there, like uh, <laughs> yeah, <just laughs> tugging at his collar, sweating. So, uh, at the end of part two, uh, the doctor sends for Evelyn because uh, he, he has somehow basically ingrained himself into Queen Mary's court <laughs> yeah. uh, as her actual doctor. And uh, so he he calls up Evelyn as much as you can call someone up uh, in... Uh, in 1555. Know, 1553, five. Um, and so Evelyn is on the way to talk to the doctor, uh, only to realize she has forgotten her bag at home and is fading from the universe. Yeah. Now, the, um, this was actually kind of funny because Francois, who's the French guy, and Thomas are kind of like, they're conspiring a bit together and they're like, oh, we can't let Evelyn reach the queen, right? Maybe we should try and kill her in transit. And then you just cut to like evil and disappearing. It's like not if I kill myself first, you know. <laughs> I'm not kill myself, but like not if I die you first. You can't kill me if I die. You can't fire me. Exactly. I quit. <laughs> uh, this this I think has to be one of the most creative cliffhanger resolutions of all time, uh, because. Basically, Reverend Thomas, he's talking with his French co-conspirator, the, uh, shoot, what's his name? Uh, Francois de, de, Noé, de Noé or something? Noé. The Abbot of Amboise. No, no. yeah. <laughs> Francois de Noé, and uh, he's like, well, what can we do? And basically Thomas comes up with this idea. Well, actually Francois comes up with the idea because Thomas mentions that Evelyn had said that the aspirin could kill someone that if they basically send Evelyn to the court, like she's currently going, uh, Francois can burst in and basically tell Mary that they're trying to kill her and that that will then like basically give Francois a better position in the court uh, to enact it. Right, and also at the same time so, get Evelyn and the doctor out of the picture. Only for Thomas to be like, oh no, I forgot to give, like, oh no, Evelyn forgot her bag. So he like saves her life in the process of trying to kill her and kill the queen. And I just think it's like such a comedy of errors, but such a great way to resolve the cliffhanger. Yeah. 10 out of 10. One of my favorite points. This of yeah, it does get a little Shakespearean in like how sort of twisted and convoluted the plotting is. <laughs> Which I guess is relevant. I don't know. To New England, right. I suppose. This fails miserably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah Francois bursts in he's like she's got like poison in her bag and she empties her bag and uh eventually gets the uh the aspirin out and Francois's like that's it that'll kill you and the doctor then basically explains that no the aspirin actually uh helps with headaches and he would even recommend that uh the queen take some aspirin and she's like what and then uh, Evelyn takes some herself, and the queen's like, all right, okay, sure, sounds <laughs> good to me. They both just keel over like two minutes later now. So they actually set this up earlier on uh, in kind of a clever way. The queen had been complaining to the doctor, I think in like part one, about having headaches. So, Yeah. Yeah, sort of a interesting little follow-up on that there. Anyway, this works. The queen uh, uh, dismisses Francois for his accusation. And becomes even more enamored with the doctor. She decides he needs recompense for his sort of, you know, close to godly act, I guess. And she decides that he and Sarah should be married. 
Because she basically says that the best thing to ever happen to her in her life was to get married. So uh, the best gift she can give to the doctor is to give Mm -hmm. him a wife. Evelyn starts putting two and two together, but winds up with five or something like that. Because she's like, wait a minute, Sarah Whiteside, John Smith, holy guacamole doctor. You're my... You're my and well, you're my great 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 right. grandfather. That's the that's a, actually the end mm-hmm. of part three. Yeah, because she's like, oh, like Sarah's children, her son, makes sense to name him after his father, John Whiteside Smith. Right. The doctor reminds Evelyn though um, that. That John Whiteside Smith's father was killed. And then Evelyn goes, oh, right. Oh, snap. We get a sick zoom in on her face. No, I'm just kidding. That's what we would have gotten if this had a visual component to it besides the cover. Besides the cover that, like, reminds me, again, of that, the the dog meme. Like, the house, the this is fine, right? Like... It's the sixth doctor looking sort of... I don't know if he looks forlorn or if he's just, I don't know, gazing up towards the heavens wondering what could be there. But it looks like he's standing right next to a fire. Anyway, into part four, they all get arrested. Yeah, and by they all, we mean specifically William Leaf, uh, Evelyn, the Doctor, and uh, George Crow. Yes. I forget exactly what the circumstance was that made them get arrested. Basically, Francois just went to the Queen again and was like, they're trying to kill you. Uh, she actually revealed that... No, what... Okay, sorry. Let me back up a little bit. What actually happens is that uh, Thomas Whiteside gets arrested... Because Evelyn accidentally said his name under her breath when she was trying to figure out how Francois knew about the aspirin. After investigating Thomas, they find out he's a Protestant, so they arrest him. And Thomas basically name names names and names the doctor and Evelyn as uh, co-conspirators and as Protestants. Yeah, he snitches on them basically. So they get locked up in the Tower of London. Which, this is like the seventh time the Doctor's been locked in the Tower of London, but anyway. I know, and it's the most boring, too. Because <laughs> it's pretty much just him and Evelyn in a jail cell, like, um, talking about what they should do, and then just doing it. That's why part four, in my opinion, was the most boring, until maybe maybe the very end, where it's just like, it feels like they just talk exactly about what they want to do, and they do it, and then that's it final 10 minutes of part four is just like oh we shoot we have some loose ends to wrap up (laughs) it does feel that way but i do feel it also puts a bow on some of the thematic concerns of the story and we'll get there perhaps we should mention one of the early kind of uh, chekhov's gun scenes relevant to the thematic um conclusion which is which is that when the doctor's first talking with sarah he has this kind of conversation with her where he asks her this this hypothetical question basically if someone is uh acting in a way that they think is just and that they think they're doing the right thing but it causes pain or death are they still a good person Mm -hmm. And he mentions that he has killed races before. um, And he wonders if he's still a good person for that because he thought he was doing the right thing. Yeah, this is, um, you know, just going in order here. This is kind of the first time Big Finish, the main range, like kind of what the reboot would go on to do, which is like have the doctor feel this immense sense of guilt. Um which, you know, the classic show, if he did feel this during the classic show, it certainly wasn't expressed in in as concrete terms as it is here and then later on what the reboot would do. Mm-hmm. 
right? Classic Who was more like, do I have the right? And then, like, two episodes later, everyone's just forgotten about that. <laughs> but it's interesting. Anyway, I think they decide they need to boat up the Thames. Well, yeah, as soon as they escape. Which they don't know how yeah. to do. Evelyn is, is like, they- oh, I can pick locks. Because, you know, those parties go late and they forget their keys. So I sometimes have to pick the locks. And the doctor's like, what? I mean, that would be great if it weren't for the fact that door is closed by just like a bar of wood over the door. Yeah, so what do they do? I forget. They just like call the guard over and smack him over the head or something. Well, Evelyn is like, I can pretend to be sick and then you can smack the guard. And he's like, no, like violence is never the answer. But then he's like, we'll talk our way out of here. And then she like starts faking that she's fading away again. And the guard comes in and she tells the doctor to smack him with the chair. Yeah. Incompetent guards, truly the the basis of all Doctor Who stories. Of all Doctor... Truly. Let me put it uh, a better way. The basis of all the Doctor's successes... Mm-hmm. Or at least like ninety percent of them. So anyway, anyway uh, they, they then boat up the Thames. They reunite with the rest of the cast of this story, and some some sick truths are revealed, including but not limited to the fact that Sarah was really uh, a, sort of a conspirator in this all along. She, on orders of who is revealed to be her husband, Thomas, was going to poison the queen. Yeah, at, at first they were going to... Uh, this is also why she was concerned about the queen's policies uh, reenacting the Catholic ban on, on clergy marriage. Yeah. So originally they thought that since Mary was going to mass, that, that she was going to get poisoned at mass, they were going to poison the sacri- sacrament... Um, Evelyn has this idea about the, like the water next to the bed being poisoned. The doctor's like, but how would like how would you know that the lady in waiting who shares her bed like would never like also drink from the water? Uh, and then when they find out Sarah was in on it, they both go, "Oh my god, the water on the bed next to the bed." Mm-hmm. We also find out that Sarah is pregnant. Yeah. Un- unlike With Evelyn's Mary. ancestor. Right. It's her and Thomas. <clears throat> and this also coheres with the whole uh, uh, Evelyn's ancestor's father was put to death because to- this is this is now also inadvertently or, or rather simultaneously revealing that Thomas is a Protestant. Yeah. <laughs> So they all just go home, except for Thomas. He's he's basically, I, I think. So they they give him a chance. The Queen's like denounce Protestantism, and I'll let you go, or something like that. Right, and he seems. She says like she won't burn him. It, she'll only like hang him in like a couple of weeks if he denounces Protestantism and helps save his friends from like also being burned at the stake by having them repent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we should mention... Uh, basically, she's like, you're still going to die, but it won't be as painful and drawn out. Yeah, and we should mention Leaf and Crow. No one bothered to help them. They're still in, in the tower. <laughs> and so you think Thomas is going to do it, but at the last second... And I think he himself thinks he's going to do it. But at the last second, he's like, hell no. Protestantism... Uh, oh, give me Protestantism or give me death. She's like, all right, death it is then. Yeah, burning up a stake it is then. <laughs> and so he kind of becomes a martyr for his religion. This is touched on again in a few minutes. This feels so out of left field, but at the same time, I, I kind of get it. Because the doctor and Evelyn are going home, and the doctor's like, man, glad we uh, put the entire disappearing thing to, uh, to rest, huh? And Evelyn's like, no, nah, actually, I still kind of feel the tingles of it. And so this is, they, they, for some reason, I don't know why, but they connect this to like, oh, we need to go save Crow and Leaf. This will put a stop to the entire affair. 
And so they go and do that. Right. They go and do that, and kind of what put a bow on it for me, and what kind of made the final, like, random ten, final ten minute thing make sense to me was that, like, they show up at Crow and Leaf's cell, they're like, they're basically, they're like in tears, bawling their eyes out, they're like, oh god, like, screw religion, I just don't want to die, like, you know, and I think one of them says, like, explicitly, like, I don't want to be a martyr, and that kind of made me think, you know, it's like, back in this, this era, it's like, what was religion really for, right? It was, it was for, it was, it was for having, like, some hope, like, some small amount of hope to cling to, right, because their lives are so bad that, like, you kind of need something to be like, look, if you do the right things now, you're going to have something better after death. <laughs> you know, sad as that is. Um, right. And so, like, it's it's really... R- religion itself isn't really, like, for the... the it's, it's not, like, for life, uh, like, as it's lived in the way it is today. Like, right today, it's like, oh, you, religion is for, like, community, and it's for, like... Um, community service and, like, doing good things, helping people, yada, yada, yada. But whereas back then, it was more just, like, life sucks so much that I need some small smidgen of hope. But, like, kind of becoming a martyr kind of defeats that, in a way. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, as tenuous as that connection may be, I kind of understood where this final, like, bit was coming from, of, like, um, Thomas had the wrong idea, right? It's like this isn't it, religion isn't for like sticking to it so strongly and becoming a martyr. It's it's for, you know, it's for something greater or something like that. I don't know. <clears throat> but anyway, mm-hmm. they free them, and that's that. That solves the problem. <laughs> yep. Although. At the end, I kind of got the impression that she was lying about having a headache again. She was just basically manipulating the doctor into saving these two random yeah, guys. <laughs> but he does it. And then he's like, okay, I'm going to take you home now. And she's like, no. And he's like, what do you mean <laughs> no? And she's like, I'm traveling with you. I'm a historian. You've got a time machine. It's like a match made in heaven. And he's like, really? Really? She suggests that they go somewhere uh, that has finer taste in chocolate. Like Mexico. Mm-hmm. The doctor sighs and he says, and he agrees, but he says he's hoping he's not making a mistake. Turns out he is not. <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> and that's that. Now, we kind of already discussed evil in a bit, um, which is something I wanted to discuss. I, I like her, and I'm looking forward to seeing more stories with her. I think she was one of the better parts of this story. Uh, again, just to reiterate for, like, the third time, just the banter she had with the Doctor or with the characters like Leaf and Crow and stuff like that was sort of what drew me into the story. More than something like The Massacre, which didn't really have any of anything like that and was just super boring. But I, something else I wanted to ask, if you don't have anything to touch on related to that, is... Related to that, no. Is, um... Who's your favorite, like... Uh, who's Big Finish done the best so far? Like, out of the Sixth Doctor, Fifth Doctor, and Seventh Doctor? Cause seventh Doctor. Seventh? Why would you say that? Well, uh, I guess because when I listened to this, you know, last week to the Fear Monger, I was like, ah, yes, this is like, this is the Seventh Doctor. This is a Seventh Doctor story. Whereas, like, when I was listening to... I don't know, any of the fourth or sixth Doctor ones so far. I'm like, oh, like... The fifth, you mean? Yeah, the, the fifth or the sixth Doctor. I'm like, oh, it's the Doctor, but, like, it just doesn't quite feel right. Like, something's missing. And I don't know what it is, you know. Uh, you know, I'm going to fully admit that I have, like, no empirical way to describe this. But it's just, like, this feeling that, like, something... Like, something is missing and... and uh, Maybe maybe it was because the fifth doctor we never got with like so far we haven't seen him with a with an actual companion arrangement that existed on screen, um, and the sixth doctor we got with like Perry everybody's favorite <laughs> companion. Well, I I was thinking something similar with regard to the fifth doctor is that like 
I don't know if the fifth doctor is all that interesting when he only has one panion. Y- you mm-hmm. know, you know what I mean? Like he's the most placid and easygoing doctor out of all of them, probably. Right. Um, and so hit him, uh, him having the three companions for a long, a lot of his time on screen, I think really helped. They all had... It was something that really works because of the fifth Doctor and not because of, like, Doctor Who as a whole in hindsight. You know, imagine sticking the sixth Doctor with, like, three companions. Mm -hmm. I think I would personally say they've done the sixth Doctor the best so far, just because they're they're giving him more, like, they're they're giving him something, at least. And they're also now giving him Evelyn um, as a companion who is, like we mentioned before, probably... uh, appears better with the sixth doctor than someone like Perry or something like that. Well, I think, I guess it depends what you mean by best. I guess I was interpreting it to mean like who's closest to what we've seen on the TV show. Oh, gotcha. You know, and and so for me, that would be the seventh doctor. I guess if you're saying like best is in like who's gotten the most character development so far, like, yeah, that would be the sixth doctor. I just meant who did you like the best, like out of all the three that we've gotten so far, who like, Oh, which one has been Still your favorite? The seventh. Yeah. Still think it's the seventh doctor, though I think that just in general, the seventh doctor is my favorite of these three. You know, he's mm-hmm. the one I like the most of these three. Yeah, he's a, he's a trickster. He's a. He has a gleam in his eye, but it's like a dark gleam. <laughs> well, I think it's because, like you were saying, he had the most character development up to this point. You know, maybe, maybe the sixth doctor will rise in the rankings after all this this character development, but. I liked the seventh doctor because he had the, you know, he had what felt almost like a character. Like maybe it wasn't fully fleshed out, but compared to the fifth or sixth doctor who, you know, the sixth doctor never really had a fair shake of the stick. So, you know, but he never really had a character arc because of that. And the fifth doctor, he too was pretty much always just this very agreeable guy who was always putting himself for, uh, last, <laughs> excuse me. Um, even to the point of like, killing himself to save Perry in Caves of Androzani. Yeah. I do think we're entering the era where it's it's becoming more clear that Big Finish is kind of redeeming the Sixth Doctor. You know, Keith, longtime listener of the show, has always been like, yeah, the Sixth Doctor is my favorite, and he's always pointed to Big Finish as like, I believe he has, as like, this is kind of yeah. part of mm-hmm. part of why that's the case. Mm-hmm. I think we're we're finally starting in this run of audios at least to see that. And I agree. Yeah, I agree. Good old Bay Band the Butcher. Oh, something I wanted to <laughs> There is a Bay Band the Butcher never mind. <laughs> big finish being big finish again. Anyway. Uh one thing I wanted to touch on was at you know the end of the story. I don't think we really made this clear. The thematic kind of conclusion to the story is when uh, when Queen Mary is going to kill Sarah. The Doctor's defense of Sarah is basically like she did everything, assuming that her marriage was like good and just and legal, and she was doing everything basically to protect her husband. Like she wasn't acting in opposition to you. She was acting in protection of her husband. You know kind of bringing back this whole when the doctor was like you know if you do everything thinking you're doing the right thing you know are you still a good person for that and kind of tying that uh, all together at the end of the the story yeah that's what's called taking the long way around just so everyone knows (laughs) (laughs) Which is fine. It's fine. It's good, actually. I don't know why it's called that, actually. I just wanted to make fun of it. My criticism literally makes no sense, but that's fine, too. Yeah, that's... Has your criticism ever made sense? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Take I don't that. know. You say that maybe as a, as a scathing joke, but I, I, I might tend to agree. <laughs> Anyway, I think something everyone can agree on is the fact that there were actors in this story and that we tend to... Co- <laughs> love, love the segue. And Keon. the fact that we tend to cover who those actors tend to be. Who they tend <laughs> <Yeah>. to be? 
<laughs> what does that it even mean? That some actors have recurring roles and that they tend to return to those roles. You know, they, they tend to be those characters more than other characters. Anyway, since you looked up the, the, the most main character of this story, a.k.a. Evelyn Smythe, why don't you take it away? Yeah, Maggie Stables. Pretty much her only, like, IMDb credits are in um, Doctor Who audios. Uh, so uh, that's... You know, nothing really outside of Doctor Who, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but she's in a lot of Doctor Who audios, uh, you know, the main range as Evelyn Smythe and, you know, maybe let's, this looks like maybe three dozen stories. No, maybe two dozen, actually, two dozen stories, let's say. Uh, she was also in a, a BBV production. Uh, she was in The Sirens of Time, actually. She played Ruth Lee, you know, uh, the assistant to the guy on the planet in the seventh Doctor's part of the story. And she's in another... Doctor Who main range story, the 50th main range release, Zagreus uh, as the great mother, and then two other random, you know, one in Bernie Summerfield and one in Sarah Jane Smith. So mainly just looks like Doctor Who audio mm -hmm. dramas. Uh, she actually uh, retired from acting in 2013 and passed away in 2014. Oh, uh, and basically she, she played evil and Smythe up until 2011. Uh, and then they retired her character after Maggie Stables passed away. Yeah. Understandable. She has. I was reading the Evil and Smythe page earlier. She has like uh, her her stories were released slightly chronologically out of order. Like her final story that was released is not the final story for her chronologically. There is a story released where she meets the Seventh Doctor and she has an adventure with the Seventh Doctor, and that is like her last canonical story timeline wise but is not the last story that was released with Evelyn yeah real river song situation except way <laughs> easier to understand yeah I don't need a flow <laughs> chart turns out I actually should have gone first on the on these because I looked up three and I believe you looked up two but that's fine yeah that's, that's okay. correct we'll, but that's yeah, fine we'll, continue that's okay just we'll yep. just roll with it I looked it. up Anna Rudden who played Queen Mary uh, this is her only Doctor Who related thing that she's been in, but she has been in other things as well, such as uh, Digging Holes, Pissed on the Job, Profile of Fear, Four Warriors, Amulet, Dinosaur, and it sounds like my job, Pissed on the Job, um, Dinosaur, Doctors, Pennyworth, and The Power. She's still acting. She's been, uh, she, her most recent credits are actually most of her credits are from recent years, like 2018 onward. Nice. Uh, so then I looked up Nicholas Pegg, not to be confused with other people with similar names. Uh, I, I was reading earlier that he got dismissed from the Doctor Who <laughs> magazine in 2017 because he included a coded message in his articles that basically sp it spelled out Panini and BBC Worldwide are... Uh, and then this article says, let's just say a word beginning with C. Um, so he doesn't write for Doctor Who magazine anymore. Uh, so he has both acting and writing credits. He writes The Spectre of Lanyon more, which I guess that's a convenient time to mention that Stephen has asked to be on that uh, when we do that episode in three weeks. So uh, that's his only writing credit for the main range, but he directed a couple of the audio dramas, a, a whole bunch of them. And he has uh, some acting credits. And he actually is on the TV show as a Dalek operator still today. Uh, as late as Eve of the Daleks, he's still a Dalek operator on the TV show. From Bad Wolf through Eve of the Daleks, he is a Dalek operator. Nice. Well, uh, I also looked up Joe Castleton, who played uh, Sarah. She's been in a lot of Doctor Who related uh, things, including BBV productions. Uh, Auton 2, Sentinel, Auton 3, Awakening, Zygon, When Being You Just Isn't Enough, as well as Lauren Anderson. She's been in a couple of BBV audios as well. 
and she's also been another big finish, uh, or at least one other big finish main range audio, Brotherhood of the Daleks, uh, as a character named Nyad, or N- N- I, it's N Y A I A D, Nyad. Hmm. Uh, perhaps related to the character of Nider in some strange way. I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. Anyway, she's been in other big Finnish ranges as well. Um, and she has also been in other things that aren't Doctor Who related. Actually, never mind. She hasn't. Just looking on IMDb here, these are all Doctor Who related. <laughs> that's not true. Okay, no, actually, that's not true. Nice. She's been in Fit, Good. The Milky Way, and Suspicion. She played a dog walker this year on, on the TV show Suspicion. And then, hey, speaking of Dalek operators, you know who else was in this story? You know who else is a famed Doctor Who uh, j- just person in general? Is <laughs> Barnaby Edwards. Who? Mm. Who's, who's a known Dalek operator in stories such as Dalek, Bad Wolf, uh, and, you know, up until the eve of the Daleks. Weird that we have two Dalek operators in this mm-hmm. story. But Barnaby continue. Edwards, uh, as people may know, has, are, has also been in a ton of other main range stories, uh, including some we've listened to. I think we've listened to... We had this discussion a couple weeks ago, I think, but we've listened to Storm Warning, right? And he was in yeah, Bang we, Bang a Boom, which I know we've listened to. The Eurovision episode. Yes, we listened to it. Story. We listened to it with flight through in time. Yeah. Um, he's been in the Eighth Doctor Adventures, the Fourth Doctor Adventures, uh, the War Doctor. So just a bunch of other different ranges. Bernice Summerfield, uh, Cyberman, Unit, the new series. Uh, he's directed a bunch of main range stories as well. So he's not just an actor. He's also a director. Um, he's directed some of the Eighth Doctor Adventures and Ninth Doctor Adventures. Uh, and Donna Noble Kidnapped. I don't even actually know what that is, but but hey. Um, he's directed some Torchwood stuff as well. And he's also, uh, as people also may know, a writer. So he's written for Big Finish as well. And let me check IMDb really quick and see if he's been in anything not Doctor Who related. Um, that he has. He's been in the BBC Proms thing. Oh, he was, a, well, he was a Dalek operator in that. Never mind. Um, yeah, those like Doctor Who at the Proms or whatever those things were. Um, yeah, he was, he's been in a couple shorts it looks like. I don't know if these are related to Big Finish or Doctor Who, but he's been in the Plotters, Crazy for You. Um, he was in the Five-ish Doctors reboot as himself. Shadows of a nice. Shadows of a Stranger. So, so was uh, Nicholas. Mm-hmm. Continue. He he played Krog. I don't remember this character, but he played Krog in the Shada. You know the one that came out like five years ago. And yeah, he's mostly just known for Doctor Who related stuff, uh, in which he's very prolific, as we've seen. Mm-hmm. And that's him. Nice. Well. Three emails to read this week. So we're just going to crack mm-hmm. on with it. From Doug, Doctor Who. Hey guys, so you asked how I heard about Big Finish's productions back in the 90s. I can't say I remember exactly, but I know that I didn't read Doctor Who magazine, so that wouldn't have been how I got my information. I used the news group rec.arts.doctor Who a lot back then, and I'm sure it was discussed. If you're unfamiliar with rec.arts.doctor Who, it was a news group, which is basically like a forum that a lot of fans and authors were on. I remember conversing with Gary Russell on there. It was the go-to place for Doctor Who fans on the internet at the time. Also, there was a website called Outpost Gallifrey. It was the website for Doctor Who convention called Gallifrey One, which used to be an annual event in the 90s and early 2000s. I don't think it's still going today. It was in Los Angeles, so down your way. Have you heard of it? Anyway, Outpost Gallifrey used to post Doctor Who news as well, and I remember visiting that site on a daily basis. Um, uh, readers note Gallifrey One actually does still run um, every year it's, it's it's still running and I know that Radio Free Scarrow um, is pretty but, prominently but involved in it the, a lot now isn't it out in the Midwest Verity now too. or am I just making that up no, no. It's, yeah okay still in LA uh, the next one is in 2023 17 to 19 uh, February huh. 20th 23 it's the 33rd Gallifrey One 
and it's uh, at the Marriott at huh. the Los Angeles airport. Uh, but anyway, so either of those places is where I would have heard about Big Finish Productions. Also, I'm sure they had a website. I know Keon said he checked and they didn't own BigFinish.com at the time, but I'm sure I was able to go to their website and look at production. I don't think I could order directly from them, but I think they may have had a U.S. distributor that I was able to order from. But it has been over 20 years and a lot has happened since then, so I don't remember exactly how things went down. Regarding Whispers of Terror, I didn't care for this one very much. Probably my least favorite of the first four audios. I think it was a good idea to have an audio villain in the audio format, but I think it just fell flat. I do remember there was a car explosion there that sounded like the answer <laughs> of a nuclear explosion, though. And with Land of the Dead, I enjoyed this one a little more than Whispers of Terror, but did think it was a little slow and hard to imagine in my mind. I always liked Nessa, so it was nice to have her back. Anyway, this one is third of the first four for me. Also, when I re- mentioned Return of the Sea Devils has possibly the worst new Who tied with Fear Her, I meant to say Legend of the Sea Devils. My bad. Take care. Yeah, we knew Doug. what you meant, Doug. We got, we got you. We got you. Yeah. <laughs> Good news, Doug. We know what you meant. With, so. with regard to Big Finish's <laughs> domain, something we should have mentioned when we talked about that that Doug brought up is that like they most certainly did, almost certainly did, have a web presence at the time. It just wasn't BigFinish.com. Which was like where the joke from the last three weeks comes from is like it was a it was like a muscle competition or something like that. But if if possible, I will try to find and by try I mean spend five minutes on and if I can't find it, give up what Big <laughs> Finish's actual domain at the time was. It's time to go down the rabbit hole. I know. You I, could take the blue pill right now I, and you could just go back to your <laughs> illusion that you didn't care about Big Finish or you can take the red pill and you can see how far this rabbit hole really goes. I, I do consider my Google food to be stronger than the average person's, so I guess this will just put it to the test. And also with regard to the who news group, I seem to remember Stephen Moffat, like... Uh, posting some of his story ideas there, which ended up becoming actual things that they used for the show. Do you remember discussing yeah. that? I kind of I remember I discussing do. that, yeah. yeah. Like before Curse of Fatal Death. Yeah. We're during the Curse of Fatal Death episode, actually, I think. That entire episode actually was just like a, a, a preemptive parody of what the Moffat era was going to a do. Preemptive like. parody. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks for the email, Doug. Yeah, thanks for the email, Doug. It, it was interesting to hear from uh, from you about how you learned about uh, Big Finish. And now we're actually going to go into another email about the same topic from JB Anderton, Big Finish Early Days. Hey, guys. Regarding the early days of Big Finish and how their product was marketed, I don't remember how I first heard of these new Doctor Who audio productions. I know there were ads in Doctor Who magazine, but I wasn't buying the magazine in the late 1990s. I'm pretty sure that I must have first read about them on the internet. But again, I don't recall where because I wasn't frequenting rec.arts.doctor Who on Usenet or any Doctor Who websites at that time. I did buy a handful of the early Doctor Who CD releases from the main range, with the first being Signs of Time. At the time, Big Finish was not set up to sell directly to the United States, so I had to buy them from various collectibles and comic stores across the country via eBay. And if I recall correctly, I paid for them by money order instead of using credit card, as I don't think the technology for secure online credit card transactions was invented yet. I was living alone in the late 90s and into the 2000s, so when a new audio would arrive in the mail, I would wait until dark, dim the lights, sit on my couch, and listen to the episodes like how they did back in the Golden Age of Radio. I was surprised that they used the 70s version of the theme instead of the later versions associated with the 5th, 6th, and 7th Doctors. According to the FAQ on the original Big Finish website, it was by choice as the producers of the audio adventures preferred that version. The FAQ also emphatically stated that they would never recast the first three Doctors. Flash forward a couple <laughs> of decades and countless spin-offs did, and we all know how that went out the window. The double CD releases would set you back $25 each, plus shipping and handling, and more often than not, I felt that the quality of the stories wasn't worth that much money. You can watch a lackluster episode of Doctor Who on PBS, and all it would cost you is an hour and a half of your time. Shelling out $25 or more for what turned out to be a lackluster story is another matter. I sold my small collection of CDs years ago, but I repurchased most of them as downloads direct from Big Finish, and once in a while, I buy a new audio if the story premise is intriguing or if it gets enough 8-10 to 10 star reviews on the timescales. Looking forward to hearing your review of the fear manga this week, JB. Uh, oh yeah, some some it may not be clear for people who don't email us, but we record these uh, about a week in advance usually, so sometimes we'll get emails for an episode that uh, hasn't gone out when the email comes in, but which we've already mm-hmm. recorded. So, like, today we're recording this on May the 30th, but it'll go out on uh, June 9, 8, 7, 6, 5th. Yeah, some mental math there. And, and yeah, just 
thanks for kind of, I guess, reminding me or, or just putting it back into perspective, I guess, JB, is like, it's like, it's it was so much harder, like even just 20 years ago, it was so much harder to get your hands on, like, I guess just that media stuff. that you wanted, yeah. It's so much easier today, a ridiculous amount easier. I was going to say uh, also like, you know, but it's also so, it's so much harder to like claim ownership over media now with like streaming. Yeah. Even with downloads from Big Finish, like at any moment they could just be like, ah, whoops, not available for download right, anymore. Right, you didn't get it by that point while well, you're just SOL. That is true. It's like the first four companion chronicles for a long time. Actually, I think they... They have them now. For the first four companion chronicles, you know, first, second, and third Doctor stories, due to some rights thing with the BBC, Big Finish didn't actually have, like, the rights to release those on download. So for, like, a long time, the only way you could get those first four companion chronicles was by buying them on CD. Mm-hmm. Um, and we could just, we could be, we could be in that era again at any point. It was just, you know, if big finish, I just stopped. <laughs> yeah. So that's the trade off. Um, but yeah, appreciate your perspective as well, JB. It seems like it lines up uh, pretty similarly with Doug's, except maybe uh, JB did more online shopping. It sounds <laughs> yeah. like. But generally, the consensus seems to be uh, for people in America, it was like not through Doctor Who magazine. Right. And just like 10 times harder to engage with Doctor Who until like uh, until 2005, basically. Well, actually, hell, even today, e- even today, it's harder for us to engage with it. Mm-hmm. Flashback to, to us having to or you rather having to subscribe to HBO Max. You mean AMC Plus or AMC Plus? Sorry. Subscribe to AMC Plus to watch Doctor Who. Yeah, I know. Same thing. They're both prestige like uh, subscription services. Yeah, I actually watched a movie on a- that was available on AMC Plus the other day. Believe it or not, uh, which yeah. actually reminded me that I haven't canceled AMC Plus since Easter. So, oops. I know that's how they get you. Like when I when I had uh, subscribed to BritBox for like it was supposed to be a week, but it turned into like it turned into longer than that. Let's just say. <laughs> It was supposed to be the week long free trial or whatever, but turns out it was neither free nor a trial. <laughs> well, maybe it was it was a trial, but it wasn't free. <laughs> That's how they get you. But uh, yeah, thanks for the email again, JB. Uh, unless Dylan had anything else to respond, no, no, I was, say in response to it. I was pulling up the next email. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, JB. Uh, okay, from Steven. Hey guys, just listened to your episode on the fear manga. I remember the radio feel of that story reminded me of the album by The Who titled The Who Sell Out, which includes fake commercials between songs. It's quite fun. I feel like I keep having to re-explain my feelings on the David Tennant thing to be more clearer on how I feel. Look, if he's back for specials only, I'm fine with it if it works, but the most important thing is that he's not the next ongoing multi-season doctor. As for how the Doctor gets his face again, this could be a situation similar to how the curator, a future incarnation of the Doctor, is Tom Baker again. On the other hand, the degeneration idea could be a play. There's a precedent for it in a 10th Doctor comic. There's an issue that ends with someone degenerating 10 so that he now looks like 9. This could have been interesting to explore, but he gets 10's face again within the first couple pages of the next issue. Reader's note, the curator was never confirmed to be a future incarnation of the Doctor, just heavily implied. Also, thanks to Big Finish, the curator is also played by Colin Baker now. So, ha. I don't know why I'm saying ha. but Double Bakers all the way across the sky. Uh, Also, apparently in the same Big Finish audio that the curator is played by the Sixth Doctor, because I was reading about this the other day for some reason, going down the rabbit hole, I guess. Big fin like the curator can just willingly change his face at any point and also appears to be like Matt Smith at some point, like the eleventh doctor's face, but anyway. Hell as yeah. for the numbering, I've been wondering if maybe it's time we do away with numbering the doctors. The thirteenth doctor and beyond sound like a mouthful. I more recently saw someone tweet a question which was what titles we would give each numbered doctor if we did away with numbering. Similar to the War Doctor and the Fugitive Doctor, I came up with the following. The Grandfather Doctor, the Flute Doctor, the Exile Doctor, the Scarf Doctor, the Cricket Doctor, the Colorful Doctor, the Manipulator Doctor. 
the half human doctor, the fantastic doctor, the trench coat doctor, the fishy doctor, the rocker doctor, the fam doctor. What about you guys? Any ideas for alternative titles for the doctors? Cheers, Steven. Sent from Keon's favorite browser, Firefox. <laughs> Hell yeah, it is my favorite browser still, despite everything. That would be uh, interesting to to do, I guess. I don't think I could do it off the top of my head, but maybe we can, when we do the notes for this episode in the description, maybe we can kind of throw it in there. Nice. Thanks for throwing us under the bus there. Thanks for giving us more work to do in the show notes, Keon. It'll, it'll actually be fun, though. And I said maybe, so that gives us an out if we don't do it. Well, my only ch- suggestion to the list that Stephen provided is to change the, manipula- the manipulator doctor to the ma- manipulative doctor. Which there's precedent for words of that form in fugitive. So not that fugitor is a word, but maybe it is. Google, help me out here. Sounds like Latin or something. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Wordsense.eu, a completely legitimate dictionary. (laughs) Fugitor, Latin. I know. know. The lowest, the, the, the lowest, like, diction, rung of dictionaries that I'm willing to, like, step onto is Wiktionary. (laughs) Like, if it's any more it actually is on wiktionary so i wonder if it's english on wiktionary because wiktionary is like an an every language dictionary (laughs) fugitor is actually a latin word according to translate dr google that translates to fugitive how did i know man i'm so good how did i even know (laughs) god (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah wiktionary has it as a latin word too so I, this is a dumb rabbit hole to go down especially since it gave key on like just like strokes key on <laughs> uh, well thanks for reaching out steven i guess key on has decided that we're doing this in the show notes so look in the show notes for our choices i suppose um Appreciate you reaching out. We'll see what happens with David Tennant. I mean, it's like over a year away. So at this point, I'm tired of speculating about it because it could be so freaking long before we get it that I'm not even going to care by the time it comes mm-hmm. out. So, right. Which is like pretty much exactly what happened with these three specials for the 13th Doctor. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks everybody for reaching out. Really appreciate it. It was nice to get so many uh, emails this week and it was a good time uh, responding to everybody. Uh, I think if that's everything we've got. Yeah, I believe we didn't have any social media comments. You can email us at thedoctordecadivegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, like events, love letters, your thoughts on uh, Queen Mary the First. You can find us on YouTube at Decade of Vegetable. You can find us anywhere else you find podcasts at Trust Your Doctor. Be sure to leave a rating if you like the show. Check us out on Facebook, Trust Your Doctor. Like us on Facebook. Also check us out on Twitter at TYD Podcast and follow us on Twitter. And next time we're going to be watching the ominously titled The Genocide Machine. But until then, the end. <laughs>